Okay, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon and good morning. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Updated Considerations for COVID-19 Preparedness and Response in U.S. Schools of Nursing, presented by Dr. Tenor Venema. My name is Brian Carey, Vice President of Marketing here at Unbound Medicine. Just a note, we are offering disaster, nur disaster nursing developed by Dr. Vienemann, as well as coronavirus guidelines to help nursing schools with this crisis. You'll hear more later, but feel free to contact Unbound Medicine for details. Now a little about the webinar. It will be about 20 to 25 minutes in length, and there will be some time for some questions at the end. Please submit your questions in the designated area on the right-hand side of your screen. If we do not get to your questions during the live presentation, Tenor will answer and reply via email to the whole group at a later date. The webinar is being recorded and we will send a link to everyone in just a couple of days so you can share with colleagues. Now let me briefly introduce our presenter. Tenor Venema is a professor of nursing and public health at Johns Hopkins School of Nursing and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. An internationally recognized expert in disaster nursing and public health emergency preparedness and as CEO of the Tenor Consulting Group. Dr. Vienema has served as a senior scientist to numerous federal agencies and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine Forum on Medical and Public Health Preparedness. She is also the editor of Disaster Nursing and Emergency Preparedness for Chemical, Biological, and Radiological Terrorism and Other Hazards, as well as the Disaster Nursing app published by Unbound Medicine. Take it away, Tenor. Thank you so much, Brian, and greetings, everyone, and thank you all for whatever time zone you're in for joining our webinar this afternoon. Um, it is always an honor and a privilege to be able to speak to nurses, to nurse educators, and to nursing students. And so I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to once again speak to you about this sort of overwhelming, chaotic, uh, environment that we're all functioning in now as the coronavirus disease evolves and spreads across the United States. I'd like to start by thanking Unbound Medicine for sponsoring this webinar and for their unwavering commitment to producing evidence-based, very high quality products and resources for healthcare professionals. And also to acknowledge the American Association of Colleges of Nursing for their ongoing commitment to supporting schools of nursing across the US. So it truly is an honor to partner with both of these wonderful groups. So let's get started. What I'm hoping to do in uh, the next half an hour is to bring you up to speed in terms of what the situational awareness currently is in the United States as it relates to the COVID-19 outbreak and its implications for working nurses and schools of nursing and nursing students. I'm gonna quickly review the CDC updated COVID-19 guidance for institutions of higher education and really try to help you think through what that means to faculty, to students, to staff, and how we work together to ensure that we optimize health and well-being for everyone involved in our academic institutions. And then finally talk about some strategies for preparedness and response activities, some guidance for developing contingency plans for schools and healthcare organizations. And I'm also going to address the acceleration of the virus as it relates to our national need to help contribute to creating higher capacity for critical care. So to start off, and I have to say, I woke up early this morning and updated most of this webinar because as I think we're all aware, the numbers and the spread of this COVID-19 virus are accelerating quite significantly over the past couple of days. And the numbers have really increased to the point that as of this morning, we have over 800,000 cases confirmed worldwide across 150 countries with an excess of over 39,000 deaths associated with COVID-19. 
We know that in some areas, these numbers are increasing daily as the disease spreads, but also as testing increases. And I think it's important to note that when we look at the global map of the spread of COVID-19, that there is probably some significant underreporting as many countries who are low resource do not have the capacity to do the testing or the reporting, or there may be political or economic considerations and pressures for countries not to report. Again, I always refer people to this map, the coronavirus COVID-19 global cases map. Uh, this was developed at Johns Hopkins University by the School of Engineering. And on, you can pull this up at any time and it will give you a very accurate update to the best numbers that are available of where the COVID-19 uh, pandemic stands and what countries are most impacted and then the deaths that are associated with the spread. Let's talk about here in the United States because it's been a tough couple of days and over the weekend we saw New York City become the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak and of course the United States now has more confirmed cases than any other country in the world with over 165,000 confirmed cases and over 3,100 deaths being reported. Just over the weekend, 914 assigned deaths occurred in New York City. Yesterday alone, there were 574 deaths related to coronavirus. And that is a significant number that we do need to pay attention to. All 50 case states have reported cases, and as of this morning, 30 states across the United States have shelter in place or stay at home orders. So just to remind ourselves about the modes of transmission for the uh, coronavirus, and I also want to state right off the bat that we continue to learn more about the transmission of this disease as each week goes by. So we know that it is spread person to person by respiratory droplets during coughing or sneezing. That close contact, six feet or less, increases the risk of transmission. But we also believe that this virus can be airborne or inhaled directly from the air. And just over the weekend, a study was released from the University of Nebraska on 13 confirmed cases that were treated at that medical center. And airborne samples were able to detect the virus particles, and they were also able to detect virus particles via PCR testing on objects within the room of the patients. And these were patients who were confirmed or were suspected COVID-19. So things like your cell phone, TV remotes, um, any type of object that you may have, they were able to uh, detect the virus from those surfaces. So touching a surface that the droplet has landed on and self-inoculation is another way of contra contracting this virus. Larger droplets are not going to float through the air, but smaller, tiny aerosolized droplets may, and we are unclear of how long they survive in the air. Just to remember, the clinical features and risk of infection include flu-like illnesses, so people present with a fever of at least 100.4, cough, shortness of breath, and now there are reports that an early sign may be uh, a lack of taste or smell. The clinical spectrum of COVID-19 has a very wide range of severity, everything from a mild disease with some nonspecific signs and symptoms to severe uh, pneumonia with respiratory failure and septic shock. There are also documented cases of asymptomatic infection with COVID-19. The disease presents two to 14 days after exposure, and we are now expanding our consideration of those populations who may be at greatest risk. Certainly older adults, um, but that includes persons of any age 
who may have underlying chronic medical conditions and immunosuppression. And of course, those individuals who are at greatest risk are those who have had contact with a known confirmed case of COVID-19 or those who have a recent travel history. There have been some attempts to categorize people into different uh, risk stratifications. I think the most important thing to remember is that there are hotspot areas across the United States, cities where we're seeing a very significant acceleration of COVID-19, which really moves us more to consider that everyone may be at higher risk than we thought. We're still learning more about viral shedding and how, uh, how people shed the virus, how long uh, the period of infectiousness is. But the take home message from this is that nurses are definitely at high risk of contracting COVID-19 because of their close proximity to patients both with confirmed COVID-19 or those who are suspected or simply presenting uh, at first with respiratory symptoms. Any procedures that involve infectious secretions, so with suctioning, bronchoalveolar lavage, uh, taking um, specimens and samples will put the nurse at significantly higher risk for transmission of the disease. There have been a number of attempts to model COVID-19 and try to project where this is going, and I'm sure you've heard them on the news uh, many times over the past two days. Uh, this is difficult because to do accurate modeling, you have to have really solid numbers to plug into your model. And because we have been so delayed and so uneven in our testing across the United States, we do not have accurate numbers. And many of the states that are reporting low numbers of confirmed cases may in actuality have many, many more, but we just don't know about it because we don't have the tests. The numbers will continue to increase as we get better and more efficient and broader in our testing programs. These models build on uh, a traditional uh, framework of those who we think are susceptible versus exposed versus infected and recovered. But again, if we don't have a clear denominator, that makes it very challenging to do the models. And what you're seeing there are examples of the pandemic curve and the different phases that a respiratory pandemic proceeds through depending on a number of factors. So all of these lines will be impacted by how successful and efficient and broad the national testing is, and then our success in implementing what's called non-pharmaceutical interventions or things like social distancing, closing of schools and universities, and asking people to remain at home. In this next section, we're going to talk about the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, resources and guidelines for institutes of higher education. And I know in this webinar, we're focusing on what are the updated guidance for schools and universities. So I'd like to be able to say that they've been changed and significantly updated since I did a previous webinar last week. But in actuality, not much has changed in terms of the CDC guidance. When you go to their website, you can log on to Institutes for Higher Education and you'll locate a list of action steps that the CDC is recommending that all schools and universities take in order to protect their faculty, students, and staff. Some of these things are listed here, such as making hand cleaning supplies readily available, encouraging students and staff to stay home if sick, monitoring absenteeism, moving to digital and distance learning, and then ensuring things such as safe housing, continuation of student services, access to meals, and looking at ways of making sure that people stay a minimum of six feet apart. So I urge you to go to the CDC website and take a look at these guidelines. 
The CDC also provides us with a decision tree for university administrators to be able to work through some of the decisions that we're being asked to make during this very difficult and challenging time. So these are issues like when to update or activate your emergency operations plan and what types of activities and action steps should be taken immediately based upon the local risk that your community is facing. As always, we are so concerned about the acceleration of the COVID-19 virus and its sustained community spread, recognizing that many states across the US right now are already in crisis and seeing their numbers increase dramatically. So some of the actions that even 10 days ago, we were saying, please consider these or think about these things. Many states have already acted decisively to suspend all in-person classes to protect the health and well-being of faculty, students, and staff. And they've chosen to move their course content to a number of different types of online course software platforms. Zoom, WebEx, GoToMeeting are all wonderful options to post course contact, content, to conduct our classes, to be able to pre-record lectures and send them to students or post to the web. And then I would strongly recommend that people increase their access to or licensing of some wonderful evidence-based, high-quality online content to enhance their educational programming using digital and mobile resources that have already been developed. I wanna remind everyone that local public health decisions, what is happening in your community and in your state must be followed in terms of guidance to shelter in place, um, stay home and uh, restrictions against congregate gatherings. Please pay very careful attention to those things as we're obligated to obey. So let's take a moment and talk about decisive action as it relates to school and university activities. For many communities right now, the best course of action is to cancel all non-essential travel, cancel all extracurricular activities, and cancel student, staff, and faculty in-person gatherings. Again, a lot of these things can simply be shifted to the online internet space. We all are committed to ensuring the continuity of our educational programs, but also our research initiatives and our service whenever possible. So you're absolutely going to want to implement your continuity plan for staffing, e-learning and distance learning options, and again, ensuring that any students who need to remain on campus have access to safe housing, meal programs, and medical and social services. And the CDC guidelines also remind us that in highly ambiguous, chaotic, very troubled times as we're living in right now, that we need to counter stigma and promote resilience by sharing evidence-based factual information and encouraging the use of campus mental health services for anyone who may need it. Let's chat for a moment about clinical placements and patient interactions. And I ask you to remember that student nurses are valuable members of the healthcare team. Placement and level of involvement in the patient care arena is certainly going to be determined by the current situation in your local state and community. As of now, we leave it up to schools and universities to make their decisions in conjunction with their state and local health departments in terms of being aware of where COVID infection is accelerating and taking that information into account when you decide whether you're going to limit access to the healthcare system for student placements. For now, we're certainly recommending that we limit direct care of COVID-19 patients, but we also have to keep in mind that as areas of community spread increase and the COVID-19 disease accelerates, 
that we may need to think about nurses as part of the healthcare team, student nurses. So again, um, any contingency plans that you either have developed or should be developing now uh, should accommodate a need for further restrictions on clinical placements in your school or university. And options might be expanding the use of simulation and virtual reality. Again, engage online resources for, clinical for teaching clinical care. There are so many wonderful resources out there. Online group chat and case studies are another way to continue teaching and engaging with students. So let's take a moment and just again focus on what is unique about public health emergency nursing. And I would propose that all of us in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic have become public health emergency nurses by default. So some of the things that immediately need to change in the way we render care address clinical care, but also health systems organization. We start off by needing to change the way we triage patients and moving to a population-based model or an infectious disease model of triage. And we have to do that, particularly in those healthcare systems such as in New York City right now, where there has been such a sudden demand for medical and nursing services that it is overwhelming the city's capacity to respond. And when we have that overwhelming uh, demand, we are faced with the need to allocate scarce resources, and we need to do it in the fairest and most equitable way possible. So by implementing infectious disease emergency triage models, we can continue to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people with the least amount of harm. We also need to understand the correct selection of NIOSH approved personal protective equipment and how to don and doff it correctly. All nurses need to understand the basic concepts of disease containment and event management when facing a pandemic situation. Here in the United States, we use the incident command system to help guide that chain of authority communication and decision making so that there is no confusion or ambiguity in terms of who is making the decisions during the event. Hospitals have adapted this model to a hospital emergency incident command system. And then again, I want to touch on the importance of moving from our typical clinical leadership models in healthcare where we tend to be collaborative or transformative. This is a time in a pandemic where we move to crisis leadership and very strong, decisive managerial decision-making, even in the absence of complete information. Earlier this week, with colleagues at the University of Michigan and at the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins, I published an article we published an article addressing the increasing demand for critical care beds, recommendations for bridging the RN staffing gap. And I urge you all to log on to the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and take a look at this article. As we are striving to rapidly ramp up our bed capacity for intensive care and critical care patients, the big challenge is who is going to staff those beds? How will we keep those nurses safe? And will those nurses have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to be able to take care of critically ill patients? Will they understand ventilator management? Do they understand the infection control and personal protective equipment measures that need to be put in place? These are critically important questions that we cannot afford to get wrong. Um, I think we've all watched the news over the past four days to see that many of the hospitals in the greater New York area are in crisis already. And we all need to think about that this may become 
our city if you're not currently residing in New York and think about what can I do? What can my school, how can I mobilize my faculty and my students to help contribute to strengthening the nursing workforce, expanding the nursing workforce, and help be prepared to participate in a surge within the healthcare system. In disaster and public health emergency management, when we talk about allocation of scarce resources, we do not do that lightly. This is a point we all dread and try to avoid. And yet the reality of it is that difficult and painful decisions may potentially lie ahead for many of us regarding the allocation of these scarce resources. And as I've alluded to before, the COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating. And what do I mean by that? When you think about that epidemic curve that you've seen on multiple broadcasts on television, recognize that a respiratory pandemic goes through a, a known set of phases and we will get through this and it will end. But in the meantime, we are at the point in the United States where the COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating. And we need to recognize that, understand the fluidity of this current situation, that needs are urgent and they are changing, and that we do lack um, some evidence on many of the topics that we need to make decisions about. In our article that we uh, published yesterday, we recommended some immediate actions to increase critical care capacity in the United States. And when I say critical care capacity, I'm talking about the nursing workforce. We've seen the Javits Center in New York converted to uh, a 1,000 bed emergency hospital. We've seen tents going up in Central Park. So the beds are there. But who are the nurses and will they have the knowledge and skills and ability to help care for patients in these types of unusual satellite healthcare settings and be able to keep themselves safe? I am very committed to working to make sure those nurses have that knowledge and skills. And I am asking everyone on this webinar to think about how they and their school can also help contribute to this effort. We know that states and localities are pooling existing rosters of registered healthcare workers, uh, emailing retired nurses and nurses who, for whatever reason, have left the nursing workforce to solicit their availability and uh, for emergency reactivation. I am advocating that we rapidly develop both in the workplace and at our schools, cross-training programs so that we can partner registered nurses in other air subspecialties of nursing with experienced critical care nurses so that they can learn the basics of critical care, such as managing ventilated patients. All of us as nurses working within our hospitals uh, and long-term care facilities and any type of um, healthcare, inpatient healthcare setting need to really look at using models of reverse triage where we go back and evaluate the clinical condition of existing inpatients to see who uh, is at low risk for a bad outcome if we were to discharge them to a lower level healthcare facility, such as a rehabilitation hospital or home, if it was safe to send that patient home. We also in our article um, emphasize the importance of redesigning workflow and roles and responsibilities within hospitals to reduce face-to-face -face contact with patients whenever possible. So what are those non-essential tasks that can be postponed or just not done? Um, avoiding unnecessary taking of vital signs, canceling uh, unnecessary or postponing unnecessary procedures, really looking at what possible actions can be taken to protect the nurse and limit ultimate face, uh, patient 
face-to-face -face contact for longer periods of time. Again, I can't reinforce the importance of implementing virtual training, both whether it's school and university-based or whether it's in the workplace, for any nurses who need to have some additional training about the epidemiology and transmission principles of COVID-19 and on those infection prevention and control measures. We are also recommending that just-in-time training on personal protective equipment, including the selection, donning, and doffing be done for all nursing staff, um, and of course, always to review and reinforce the basics of good hand washing and hand washing audits in healthcare settings to ensure compliance. We have recommended uh, and are strongly encouraging that the larger, better resourced healthcare systems and urban hospitals might consider deploying an infection control nurse or a critical care nurse specialist from their center out to a rural or critical access hospital in your state to provide some guidance, um, a train the trainer resource and some support for those smaller rural and critical access hospitals who are going to be asked to take care of critical patients when they may not have done so or had resources to do so for a very long time. I want to take this moment in time to ask each school of nursing to please think about the amount of infection control and prevention content that is contained within your curriculum and to consider expanding this, not only the amount covered, but the frequency in which it is offered. Um, disaster nursing and public health emergency response and infection control and prevention content has always been important, but it has never ever been as critical as it is right now. This is the information that will help keep our nurses and our nursing students safe. At a minimum, the topics that should be addressed in any type of just-in-time training or woven through courses is disease surveillance and dete detection basics, isolation, quarantine, and containment. What do those words mean? How do we do it? Standard contact and airborne precautions, proper hand washing and cough and respiratory etiquette, and the selection and appropriate use of NIOSH approved personal protective equipment. Healthcare providers can protect themselves if they assess and triage patients quickly with acute respiratory symptoms and be able to act to isolate that patient, place a face mask on them, and if possible, put them in an airborne infection isolation room, if not, to put them in a patient room with the door closed whenever possible. And then again, immediately and consistently implementing standard contact and airborne precautions, including the use of eye protection when caring for COVID-19 patients. Um, this is just a basic reminder for all of us that performing hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand rub before and after all patient contact uh, or contact with any potentially infectious material is critically important, and that includes doing it before and after the removal of PPE, including gloves, washing hands frequently, the importance of practicing how to properly don, use, and doff PPE in a manner so that the nurse avoids self-contamination is very, very important. And then there are certain aerosol generating procedures uh, that just put the nurse at such higher risk that if there is any way they can be put in an airborne isolation room, they should. There are a number of resources. These came from the CDC in terms of guidelines for putting on and safely removing personal protective equipment. And I want to say that I think all nursing faculty who are responsible for weaving these threads of information about public health emergency response and disease containment 
and infection prevention and control should spend some time themselves making sure that you understand and are up to date on your own education on these topics and that you are very familiar with the use of personal protective equipment and how to don and doff it. So this should not just be happening in those individuals responsible for leading simulation or oversight of, of clinical rotations, but we all need to know how to do this. Um, the, the issues of when do you use an N95 filtering face piece mask, can you reuse it, how are we going to decontaminate these, uh, they should, in theory, should not be reused, but given the constraints and the lack of access to personal protective equipment in different states and in different cities, um, this has become a very pressing issue. Uh, I will, um, again, refer you to the CDC guidelines for the use of N95 filtering face piece respirators. Uh, there are in, uh, many institutions where because of the overwhelming surge of patients, the nurses are wearing their N95 all day long and even putting a surgical face mask over it in between patients and then disposing of the surgical face mask. Some updates that I can provide to you today that I think are uh, of good news and some advances uh, that have been made. Um, the the federal, uh, federal government, a number of the different federal agencies are now moving quickly to try to advance uh, a number of issues. The FDA has expedited review of diagnostic tests to combat COVID-19 and as of Saturday, Abbott Labs uh, was approved for a point of care test for COVID-19 that will show a positive result in five minutes. So once those tests are distributed, that will help to increase uh, the amount of testing that happens. Uh, the FDA has also expanded what's called it, its emergency use authority. An emergency use authority is a slightly relaxed standard for things such as diagnostics, some medications, and then some approved uh, personal protective equipment so that we can get it to healthcare providers um, much quicker. Uh, FDA, the NIH, working in collaboration with the Veterans Administration, have also moved to try to um, explore 3D printing of different pieces of critical supplies, including, including pieces for personal protective equipment and face masks. So we're optimistic uh, that those actions will help increase testing, increase uh, access to uh, more personal protective equipment, and of course, uh, we're hoping uh, for a lot of movement on some of the new drug therapies and the convalescent serum and things that may prove promising. Getting back to considerations for personal protective equipment, the FDA has also given emergency use authority over reusable elastomeric respirators. These are respirators commonly used in industry, including uh, in the nuclear industry. They are very, very reliable and can be cleaned and disinfected and reused uh, and also uh, are a wonderful adjunct for PPE for our emergency frontline responders. I think we're all aware that our emergency departments are functioning in disaster mode even before this crisis hit and things are rapidly, rapidly expanding. I do believe that schools of nursing need to look at their nursing students as potentially as workforce extenders for surge capacity as the outbreak continues. Now is the time to develop those contingency staffing plans and protective actions regarding how and where nursing students might be allowed to go within the healthcare system in order to help should the pandemic worsen. Senior level students in particular have a level of skill mix that could be very helpful and they could be valuable additions to the staffing mix, taking over many of the duties of certified nurses aides or licensed practical nurses. 
we are also looking at ways of constructing national nurse response teams who are infectious disease experts, um, super users of personal protective equipment, and able to provide some guidance and relief and train the trainer type cat, um, uh, resources. I think we can look to the extraordinary measures that nurses and nursing students have already been required to take in other countries that have been so affected by COVID-19. And we need to take the lesson from that and prepare now to think about what types of patient populations, where is their lower risk, where potentially nursing students could be used to help out should we need them. In order to do that, it may require postponing of normal coursework and prioritizing the infectious disease response, using online simulation labs for additional enhanced infection prevention and control training, certainly screening students to ensure that they are healthy and ready to participate in the workforce, working with our hospital partners to develop supervisory uh, and contingency plans to accommodate um, supporting these students and supporting the faculty that would need to be involved. I remind us all that during public health emergencies, our norms of healthcare professionalism in nursing remain true and in full effect. We have an ethical duty to provide the best care we possibly can and not to abandon our patients, to respect all persons, and to do our best even in highly chaotic, stressful situations to do benefit and prevent harm. All nurses have a moral, ethical, and professional responsibility to be prepared and to contribute to COVID-19 response in some way. On that note, I just want to touch back to the disaster nursing app that I did develop with Unbound Medicine. It is available to nursing students free of charge, and it has up-to-date current evidence-based content on addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, in addition to over 400 other types of disasters and public health emergencies. Um, there's sections that this, this content is specifically written for nurses. So we have taken information that may be available from the CDC, from other websites, but tailored it to exactly what nurses, advanced practice nurses and nurse educators need to know. Um, I uh, provide for you here that link to the Hopkins coronavirus map so that as you make your decisions and gather information, you can get reliable updates on where the pandemic is. And then, of course, uh, the CDC website. I want to also bring attention to two additional webinars that I think will be of value. Um, the National Academy of Medicine on April 1st from 5 to 6.30 p.m. is hosting a national webinar on the science of social distancing. And then the CDC hosts regular uh, updates for clinicians. There is one Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock, and it will address the clinical management of critically ill adults with COVID-19. So both of those are uh, two additional webinars that you and your faculty and staff and students may want to log into to continue your education about what is happening in COVID-19 and how we all can contribute to responding. I want to take a moment and recognize that there are some wonderful resources that have been involved. I'm thinking about two colleagues, Dr. Christine Qureshi at the University of Hawaii, who with colleagues has developed a course for schools of nursing in the state of Hawaii. Uh, and then the Society for the Advancement of Disaster Nursing website, and you can Google that, has a number of colleagues across the US uh, who have developed resources and uh, what's called ThingLink modules using the Creative Commons uh, platform. Uh, that initiative was led by Dr. Roberta Lavin. 
We have some wonderful resources that you can download. They're interactive platforms for students. Uh, there's one uh, we just finished on COVID-19 and we're building some additional ones. We welcome other schools to take these resources and use them. Now is the time for the nursing community to come together, to collaborate, to communicate well, to share our resources, and to demonstrate our strength as a profession in protecting ourselves and building resiliency into all of our nurses and our nursing students. So I ask you as a nursing community to work with me, to work with each other, so that we can strengthen our schools and our academic engines and at the same time contribute to our communities and our health system in terms of building our capacity to increase critical care across the United States. So on that note, I'm going to um, pause uh, and take a question. Uh, hang on one moment. Um, so uh, one, one question that has come in is how can schools, um, how can schools actively contribute to strengthening the nursing workforce? Um, so I think my immediate response uh, to that would be uh, now is the time to build on what we call in uh, public health emergency response, the three C's, communication, communication, cooperation, and collaboration. And so schools that can reach out to each other within their own state, reach out to their medical reserve corps, work with your uh, contacts at your large health uh, healthcare systems and hospitals, reach out to the smaller hospitals and really start a conversation of how you can share time, treasure, and talent. So you have faculty and students who can participate with their time. We have uh, resources in terms of treasure that we can help to, whether it's uh, equipment or uh, extra PPE that we can donate, and then share our wisdom as nurse educators, um, and particularly thinking about nurses in federally funded community health centers, long-term care facilities, home health, where they really uh, may have been isolated and could really benefit from additional resources and input. So on that note, I want to sincerely thank you all for your commitment, for participating in this webinar today, and for all of the work you're doing. I'm very grateful to be able to work with you, uh, very honored to call myself a nurse, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Tenor. Um, just a reminder, I want to thank everyone also from Unbound Medicine. Thank you so much for coming. Um, the, the offer that uh, Tenor talked about earlier in the presentation. Um, if you are interested in disaster nursing um, and or, and or uh, coronavirus guidelines uh, from Unbound Medicine, um, just contact us at sales at unboundmedicine.com um, and that will be uh, offered for free for students and faculty. Um, and Unbound Medicine would also like to thank all the nurses for their service um, and please be safe uh, during this unsure time. Thank you all again for coming. Have a great afternoon.